This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're broadcasting from San Francisco, the site of this week's Global Climate Action Summit. We begin today's show behind the scenes of California's raging climate-fueled wildfires, with the hidden men and women on the front lines of the state's ever-growing fire season, prisoner firefighters. Of the 13,000 firefighters battling blazes across California, more than 2,500 are incarcerated. While salaried firefighters earn an annual mean wage of $74,000 a year plus benefits, prisoners earn a dollar per hour when fighting active fires. According to some estimates, California saves up to $100 million a year by using prison labor to fight its biggest environmental problem. In August, California Governor Jerry Brown thanked the firefighters on the front lines, including those who are incarcerated. You've heard there's a tremendous effort fighting these fires, and I want to personally thank all the firefighters who are on the line. Uh, the members of CAL FIRE, uh, also the National Guard, and the thousands of inmates who are also on the line fighting to protect lives and uh, bring these fires to a, a quick close to the extent that's at all possible. Incarcerated firefighters live in 44 low-security field camps throughout California, including three camps for women and one for juveniles. They're routinely called upon to fight the state's most dangerous fires. In the last year alone, the state has seen the largest fire in California history, the Mendocino Complex fire, and the most destructive, the Tubbs fire in 2017, which killed 24 people and destroyed more than 5,600 homes. In 2017, prisoner firefighters spent four million hours on active fires. As climate change leads to longer and more dangerous fire seasons in California and the state's firefighting agency, CAL FIRE, is running out of money, California is increasingly relying on its prisoner fire force to combat wildfires. Prison firefighters earn time off of their sentences for good behavior, typically two days off for each day served. But critics of the program say the state is exploiting prisoners' eagerness to earn time for early release. Well, the Democracy Now! team traveled to the Delta Conservation Camp about an hour north of San Francisco Sunday to a low-security prison where more than 100 men are imprisoned. We interviewed incarcerated firefighters who had just returned from a 24-hour shift fighting the Snell Fire in Napa County. We spoke to them under the close surveillance of prison administrators. I began by talking to some of the officials from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I'm my sergeant reader. I'm the assistant camp commander at this camp. And what fire did they just come in from? They came up from the Snell Fire. And where is the Snell Fire? It's uh, southeast of Middletown. And how long has it been burning? Uh, yesterday afternoon. Huh. It started, I think, about 3 o'clock yesterday, and it went up to 1,700 acres by, like, 8 o'clock last night. And how important are these fire camps of incarcerated uh, people to fighting fires in, in California? The inmate firefighters are the backbone of CAL FIRE. They are do all, they get the toughest assignment there is out there. What's the toughest assignment? <laughs> Whatever they're asked to do. So usually it's cutting line where a dozer can't go. Mm. So they get the toughest assignments um, in the worst conditions, 110 degrees in the middle of the sun, carrying, wearing two layers of clothing, carrying 40 pounds of gear. Mm. And then they have to carry all their food and water for a 24-hour shift mm. and then swing a tool the whole time. And you're saying they do the toughest jobs? They get the toughest assignments there is. Mm. How much do they get paid? A dollar an hour. So the state is really dependent on these prisoner firefighters? Definitely, yes. Make, they save a lot of money for the state. You know about how much? Um, I've heard anywhere from 60 to $100 million a year. My name is Tracy Snyder. I'm a correctional captain with CDCR, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. And talk about what happens here. Um, how often do they fight fires? Uh, how often are they he just here at camp? So obviously fighting fires, it's it's that's unpredictable. Last year was one of our biggest fire seasons. 2015 was another big fire season. Um, last year, obviously, uh, fire season la lasted for somewhere around six to eight months. Um, the Santa Rosa fire, the Napa fire, these guys were responded to that, the Thomas fire um, down in Southern California. Would you call these men heroes? 
I would, yes. They do an excellent job for the state of California. When you see um, the devastation in Santa Rosa and Napa last year and uh, Montecito down in Southern California with the Thomas fire, these guys, as the sergeant said, they're the backbone. They do a great job, a great job, and I appreciate them. After the returning firefighters have breakfast, I sit down with a few of them under the watchful eye of prison officials. Well, my name is Dante Youngblood. I came to camp 14 months ago. Hmm. I've been in jail nine years. Hmm. How much more time do you have to serve? One more year. So talk about the work you do here. Are you risking your life? I wouldn't, well, I guess you could say you're risking your life, yes, but, but you're not really in life-threatening situations. 95% of the time, you're not in a life-threatening situation. You in, you in a controlled environment. You know, you know, if you've been doing it for a while, you know what to do. But it's, it's a hard job, for sure, because we got to cut line. The fire could be right there, and then we'd be cutting line on the fire to stop it from coming. What do you mean, cutting line? Well, we cut a line with a McLeod. What is a McLeod? It's a, it's a tool. It's a tool. It's like, a, it's like something like a hoe, yeah. like you're using your garden. And we cut line with it, four-foot line, to stop the fire from coming. So you've had the fire as close as like a couple of feet from where we are? Yes. Is it scary? Well, I guess it gets scary. It used to, when you first started, you would be scary. Some of the inmates, some of the other people would be scary, some of the crew members, but it's to me, no, it's not. It's just regular to me. To me, it's just regular work. I didn't already program myself to just, whenever we go, we just go. It's just, it don't even bother me. I just, it's just all right. It's just, it's just work. It's work that we doing. Last night, one of the guys fell down the hill? Yes. What happened? Well, it just, it just, it's slippery. Rocks, rocks and slippery. He just, he didn't feel that bad. It just was a little fall. He just sprang his ankle or something. But it happens. It do happen. Stuff, trees fall on you. Mm -hmm. All of that. Like the last fire we was at, I think, what, a month ago, a firefighter died. Cause a tree free firefighter? Yeah, or? free firefighter. Because mm -hmm. the tree fell on him. That's how it goes. It's, 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 it gets crazy out there sometimes, but most of the time it's, we know what's going on. Are you shoulder to shoulder with the Cal Fire firefighters? Yes. Yeah, we cut line together. We be out there. We don't, they don't, we're not split up from them. Like, we're not like, oh, bring the inmates over here and them. Over. Nah, it's not like that. We just, we all out there together. We all out there helping each other. Like, if I walk by one and I see a Cal Fire or, or any firefighter and he need help or something with the holes or something like that, I help him. Because mm -hmm. they'll help us too. We, we all here to help each other and make sure everybody's safe. How much money do you make? A dollar hour. When you're fighting the fire? Yes, when you're fighting the fire, a dollar hour. So how, for example, last night, were you, how long were you fighting the fire? Probably 20 something hours. So we probably made $20, $22, $24. What do you think of that? Well, I don't think, I think we should make, of course I would say I wouldn't, anybody that got a job, you, you would think you should make more. I always thought we was, I thought we was getting $2 until I came to fire camp. But you know, it's, it's, it's cool though. I mean, we making money for something that we'll probably do for free anyway, just for the time cut. So it's all right. But I would prefer, yes, we get more money. Of course, anybody would, in a working position will want to make more money. So you're saving the state, to say the least, a lot of money. Some say it's something like $100 million a year. I, I don't know. I, don't, I mean, of course that, I'm sure, but I mean, we, we don't even, some people don't even, we look at it as getting the time. The time cut is more than the money to us. We'd rather make the money for sure because we could still send money to our families. We still send money home, but yeah, we only make a dollar hour on the fires. So how old were you when you first went to prison? I was, it was nine years ago. I think I was 20, 27. Mm -hmm. Did you want to talk about what happened? <laughs> nah. Uh -huh. I just made bad choices. Has being here at the camp changed your thinking about the world? Yes. I mean, I've, I've, I could say I've, I've learned a lot, just that I can do more than what I used to do, that I can do right, I can do better things with my life and then just commit crime and do things like that. I, I, I figured out I can do a job. I could work. I never I never had a, a job a day in my life. I never cashed a check. Literally, I ain't never cashed a check in my life. I ain't never used a credit card. It's crazy. I just sound like I'm from the mountains or something. 
What made you decide to do this interview? It's the first time you've talked to a journalist? Because I might want to go to Hollywood and be an actor or something. I want to see if I can do it. <laughs> I'm serious. Plus, I wanted y'all to get our perspective. Because I know you can hear from the guards, from other the captains, but... And then I know a lot of people here probably don't want to do the interview, probably scared, or just don't want to do it, but I'm not. I do whatever I want to do. Can you vote? No felons can vote. Can you vote? No felons can vote. You know, that's interesting, because in Vermont and Maine, they can vote from jail. No, no felons can vote in California. Would you like to see that change? Yes. Hmm. But we can't. We can't talk about it. This is, guys, camp. This is camp. Okay. camp only. Okay. Not for voting policies. Yeah. Okay. No, let me tell you the reason I asked that is that in Vermont— At this point in the interview, Sergeant Reeder steps in to end the conversation with Dante, telling us political questions aren't allowed. Later, the commander comes over. Yes, I'm uh, Lieutenant Sid Turner. I'm the camp commander here at Delta Conservation Camp. Talk about how hard this work is. This is, uh, for an inmate in the state of California, this is the hardest work that you're going to find when they're out there on the line uh, doing their doing the work that they're expected to do. Um, it's, it's extremely physically um, demanding. Uh, the hours can be exhausting at times. For example, last year when we had the Napa fires, they were actually out for three days straight because the resources within the state were so tapped that it took that long just to get them relieved and off the lines. And they make just a dollar an hour fighting these fires next to Cal Fire firefighters? Uh, that is correct, but understand there's a big difference between Cal Fire firefighters and an inmate firefighter. Do you think they should be paid more, the prisoners? I believe that they should make uh, more than the dollar an hour. They've been at that rate of pay for uh, many decades now at this point in time. So it seems like the state would be threatened if uh, <clears throat> if people's time was even cut or if uh, as a result of overcrowded prisons, more prisoners were released. Of course, they would be the um, prisoners who uh, had the lowest sentences, and those are exactly the prisoners who get into these kinds of camps. They'd lose that kind of labor, the firefighting labor. Potentially very much so. There is definitely a need for this type of a resource, the hand crews to go out and, and cut line in areas that aren't accessible to equipment such as bulldozers and, and things of that type. So California needs hand crews. If we don't have the inmates to perform that function, then they got to find the labor from someplace else. Sergeant Reader, do you think the prisoners should be paid more for fighting fires? Yes. They're doing the same work as Cal Fire, the firefighters who are free. Um, I think we do harder work. I think we get the harder assignments. Nobody else can touch us. The question of how much California relies on prison labor, particularly when it comes to fighting wildfires, came under scrutiny in 2014. Lawyers in the state attorney general's office argued in federal court that a program to parole more prisoners would drain the state's source of cheap labor. The California attorney general at the time was, well, now U.S. Senator Kamala Harris. She later said lawyers in her office argued the case without her knowledge. Harris said the idea of incarcerating people as a source of labor evokes images of chain gangs. I sit down with another prisoner who just came back from fighting the Snell fire. My name is Marty Vinson. I'm 25 years old, and I came to this camp about mid-July this year. What has been the most difficult fire that you fought? At first, I, I wanted to say at Eel River when I went to Detwater last year. Detwater was a pretty bad fire, but the river fire this year at Delta, I think, topped it, because it was the most, like— I guess harm's way I've been in. It was a situation where we was back burning, and they had this one of our saw teams, which was my saw and me, uh, bumped down with crew three to cut on the other side on the green to where if there are emberms coming across, it's still pushed back more to where it just doesn't catch. And it led to a point where it flared up more than it had to on the fire that was burning. And when it did that, it jumped the line. So when it jumped the line, Mind you, the puller I left out, we carry a gallon of gas on our back. So 
when that happened, we pretty much immediately have to run down the mountain. And as we ran down the mountain, we ran into the highway. As we ran into the highway, one of the captains escorted us down the street. But as we was going down the street, now the fire jumped from where it was burning at, where it was supposed to burn at, to the green across the road. And within seconds, the whole highway went from a nice bright day to just dark smoke and, and fire everywhere. So we had to run as far pretty much down that highway until it was green again. And then as it continued to burn and the black was there and it was safe to go back, we actually had to walk back in there. So just being put in a, a bad predicament like that to where that adrenaline is really pumping and you know you try to figure out the best thing to do because possibly your life is on the line. I would want to say the river fire this year was the worst one for me. Do you think of yourself as a hero? Um, I like to look at myself as somebody that I want to be here for whoever, like whoever needs me, I want to be there for them. Just last night on this fire, we had somebody who came back not too long ago where the terrain of where we was climbing up, cutting line, there was just too many loose boulders. And, you know, we always try to, you know, do what we have to do but still provide safety while doing it. And it's just one of those situations where it's no one's fault, but it happens. And um, while there's cutting a line, a boulder actually fell and hit him. And he popped something in his knee and it just swelled up. And it came to a point where they, we didn't really have no, no answer to it. What are we gonna do? How are we gonna get him out here? It's night. They don't do no airlifts at night. They don't want nothing in the air at night. So it led to the possibility of us just bedding down at the bottom of this creek and wait to like morning and it was just something where it's a natural thing about me I want to be there for people so I just volunteered and said well look me personally I don't feel like it's relevant for us to stay down here so I just volunteered to take my pack off and carry him up the mountain so you carried him up from below near the creek yes it, it the first part was maybe the worst part it was real steep um, a lot of people didn't think it would actually happen like that, but it was something that I just pushed myself to say I'm going to do, and I got it done. We went going straight uphill to having to go side hill, which that was another, you know, cautious area because the road was probably like two feet wide. So it was something, it, it took its time. It went from two in the morning to like almost five in the morning, but we got him up there, and now he's back here. Mm. You're risking your life here. It's exactly what's going on. Everything we do, you know, no one's really promised to come back. And how much do you make? A um, dollar an hour. When you're fighting a fire? When you're fighting a fire, a dollar an hour. When you're on typical grade, you make a dollar forty-five a day. Some have called it slave labor. What do you think of that? Um, <laughs> I don't really want to call the work slave work. But I feel like it's, it's their whole mentality and what they're, they're thinking about at the end of the day. No matter what, regardless if we're incarcerated or we're free, we're getting paid a dollar an hour. That was Marty Vinson, an incarcerated firefighter at the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation's Delta Conservation Camp low-security prison camp in Fairfield, California, where more than 100 incarcerated firefighters are housed. They earn a dollar an hour for fighting California wildfires, saving the state $100 million per year. Special thanks to Democracy Now!'s Libby Rainey, John Hamilton, Carla Wills, Ariel Boone, and Mike Burke for that report. When we come back, we'll be joined by Amika Mota. She, too, fought fires when she was incarcerated. Stay with us.